Thank you, Lord God. You don't have to receive our worship, but you do. And we're grateful for that. You don't have to receive us, but you do. And we're grateful for that. So, Lord God, hallelujah. You're welcome in this place. We're waiting for your saturation. Hallelujah. Do it for your glory. Do it because you're the only one that can. My God. And we'll love you for it. In Jesus' name. to the 44th anniversary celebration of Bishop and Sister Smith here at the Apostolic Faith Church. You are in store for a wonderful celebration and we are so happy to have you with us. If you can help serve in our neighbor's fresh market food pantry, please visit us at afcchicago.org slash food pantry and sign up to serve on Tuesdays from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. or on Wednesdays from 9 a.m. until noon. You can save lives by donating blood during our quarterly blood drive taking place during Holy Week. You can schedule a time or just drop in on Wednesday, March 27th between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. We are getting ready for an awesome Holy Week experience with daily prayer at noon, special online videos, and prayer at the cross. Take a look at this. Celebrate Holy Week with Bishop R.C. Smith, M.D., and the Apostolic Faith Church family beginning on Palm Sunday, March 24th at 10 a.m. for a special service featuring our youth ministries. Come nail your prayers to the cross in our chapel from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. If you cannot be in person, please send in your prayer request by clicking the link at afcchicago.org slash holy week. Join us for a special time of teaching as we explore the life of Jesus. And you don't want to miss the life-changing experience of foot washing with your brothers and sisters on Wednesday, March 27th at 7 p.m. We will hear the last seven words of Christ and share in Holy Communion on Good Friday, March 29th at noon in our sanctuary. And we invite everyone to meet us at St. Sabina at 7 p.m. on Good Friday as Bishop Smith joins their special service at 1210 West 78th Place in Chicago. Be sure to bring someone with you to Resurrection Sunday. March 31st at 10 a.m. as our creative arts ministries help us celebrate Easter along with a special word from Bishop R.C. Smith, M.D. Get all the information and follow along online at afcchicago.org slash Holy Week. The promise of Jeremiah 3 and 15 is demonstrated in the lives of Bishop R.C. Smith and First Lady Susan D. Smith. For 44 years, they have stood as an example of what servant leadership is, ensuring the Apostolic Faith Church grew in knowledge and understanding and serving as a beacon to the city of Chicago. Their journey has taken them around the world, spreading the love of Christ through their shared medical and spiritual expertise. From serving in small towns in India to marching for justice in the streets of Chicago, their commitment to everyone they see is genuine and contagious. Their leadership stretches across denominations, beyond borders, reaching out to all, and challenging all of us to give our very best to others. As they serve as shepherds of the Apostolic Faith Church family, we salute them and give glory to God for their legacy. And now, please stand as we welcome Bishop Horace and First Lady Susan Smith.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen, amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. This is a joyous day. And we're going to ask Bishop and Sister Smith to please join us. Amen. Bishop and Sister Smith, your staff just had to be a part of this year's anniversary celebration. We don't always get to say much outside of the office because they keep us in the back. But we always get to say how much we love you. And we had to jump in for this opportunity because we have truly seen your love, your dedication and commitment over these 44 years in ways that have challenged us to become everything that God demands of us. Some of the trustees and staff have been here for the entire time, while others of us have come alongside over the years. But in every interaction, we have felt your heart as shepherds and servant leaders of this congregation. We know the sacrifices you have made. We have seen your tears during difficult times, along with your cheers during joyous times. So we want to be sure you feel all the love we have for you, and that's why we think this year's gift will be something you will truly enjoy. Bishop and Sister Smith, we know the happiest place on earth for you is anywhere with your grandchildren. So we have arranged for you and your entire family to spend a week at an Airbnb of your choice. Woo! We pray this will be a time for you to connect and enjoy time together so that you can return to us rejuvenated. Yeah. And Bishop and Sister Smith, we don't need any notes for this. Uh, we just want to say that we truly love you. We count it a privilege and an honor to have you as our pastors. We thank God for you. Simplify the love of God, and truly, we all want to say, happy anniversary. Praise the Lord, everyone. Please be seated. Bishop said, what's an Airbnb? So, so, so we have to go, okay? But, uh, I just appreciate this. You know that how much I love. I love you all. love everyone in this church. Uh, our speakers today, I just want to thank you ahead of time for coming. I know our psalmstress, uh, she's over there somewhere. I'm, I'm glad she's here. I know she's going to do a wonderful job. The choir, the ushers, everyone just works so hard in this church, and, and I truly appreciate it. I appreciate the staff. We couldn't, we couldn't do anything without a good staff. So appreciate our staff, and I appreciate you. I love you. And Lori Jordan's going to give me those red shoes. So God bless you all. This is a, a special day. Uh, but I, I was sharing with the ministers upstairs today about um, how awesome God is for so many of us. Uh, and last night my wife and I talked about this day you know 44 years it certainly does not seem that way but the truth of the matter is that uh, because of the unbelievable favor and grace of God 
uh, that all of us enjoy. Uh, every day becomes a blessing. Even in the valleys, even in the times of stress and, and strain and trouble, we, ha we have an anchor, we have a hope that has fueled what uh, Sister Smith and I believe. We believe that, that God has a will and, and our chief objective is to fulfill that. Um, we are privileged because we have been blessed to fulfill it through all of you. Uh, not only those that uh, are here in the space today, but uh, I just got back again on Thursday night uh, from a trip and I was gone the week before, I'll be gone this week as well. And again, as you get older, you begin to reflect about the blessings in your life. And, and I've got friends and people that I hold in high esteem around this world, uh, around this country and in so many different locations. I can't begin to name them, but I will tell you this, uh, that there are no people like the people of Apostolic Faith Church. They really aren't. And, and I really mean that. I don't know the other words to say about it. I, people say, you, you, you have a, you, you're, you're prejudiced about that church. They're right. I love this church. I love these people. I love you. Um, I value what this church has meant to me. Uh, as a little boy down through the years and could not have imagined st standing here today, but I, I praise God for you. And, and so uh, this day is very special. You have allowed me uh, such a great, great position to stand before you every week, uh, week in and week out, uh, to be a part of your lives. I wish I could know more of you in a more personal way. It is my greatest hope uh, as we understand God's will for our future. I do want to say one thing because I know we emphasize it and, and they gave us the, uh, the, I know what Airbnb is, that's, you like, you rent like a house, right? Yeah, I, I saw it on TV, I saw, yeah. Yeah, uh, and, and they said because our greatest joy with our grandchildren, but uh, I, I want to try to understand something better than that. Uh, I have, we have three daughters. Hmm. who have never brought us shame. They have never been out of order. There is nobody like Lauren, Rachel, and Emily. Please stand. No. Wow. Wow. I'll say it. Wow. Uh, Parents understand that, that, um, no, it's, it's amazing as I look at them and, and I have to uh, accede to the fact that, that I'm older. I mean, they, you know, I talk about my daughters and, and as young people and my wife said, they're almost 40. One of them is, um, I'm gonna say this, uh, I'm proud to call uh, Emily my colleague, Dr. Green, yeah. Rachel has finished uh, her thesis and is, next week she will defend her PhD. Stand up, Rachel. Professor at Columbia. Lauren is upstairs, I'm sure right now, working with our children. Where is she? She behind me? Yeah. What, what's, what's your degree gonna be in, your doctorate? Come, come say it. You, you're the oldest. You want to talk anyway. It's called Critical Pedagogies and Urban Teacher Education. She is well on her way to finishing her writing. I, I don't know where they get this, this kind of desire to, to go higher. They always said about me, our, our dad, he's a good dad. He always inspects our uh, homework and our grades. But his problem is that you know, you'll, you'll, you'll show him your grades and he'll say, boy, you're on, you on the, uh, the A minus honor roll, you got two Bs. And as he, he gives you a compliment, he'll say, now what can you do to be better? They say this about me, you always want more, but I always want more for you. 
No, that, that is the greatest privilege that anybody has to, to pour in, into the lives of others. I was sharing again this morning with the ministers about uh, Samuel. I won't take a long time. I'm almost done, I think. Um, when he went down to Jesse's house, uh, and we, we remember so many great things in scriptural passages, certain things step, stand out. Um, but in that first uh, Samuel chapter 16, two, twice he says this to Samuel. He says, Samuel, there's somebody in Jesse's house who is taking care of the sheep. And when the sons appeared before Samuel and, he, and Samuel said, surely this must be the Lord's anointed. At the end of it, the Lord said, don't touch that one because I have not called him. And then at the end of it, when he had anointed David, in the same passage it says, Saul is having problems. And, 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 uh, bear with me. It, it says he has a, an evil spirit from the Lord. And, and I do believe that, but... but I think the Bible is written in, in, the, in the contemporary culture of the day. They did not understand the kind of problems that Emily deals with all the time. We, we, we get spirit and soul mixed up. He had connected problems in his spirit, but also in his soul. And somebody said, but there is a young man, a Bethlehemite, who lives in the house of Jesse. In the way he describes him, he is the one that takes care of the sheep. Thank you for allowing me to be the one to take care of the sheep. to do something. Give the Lord praise this morning. Yeah, no, I, I, mean, I mean that. I mean that. I mean that. Can you help me to greet uh, thousands of people every Sunday? I'm always just overwhelmed that we average 43 countries around the world uh, and literally thousands of people in every state uh, of the union that uh, tune in to these services. And so I want you to help me to greet. Uh, some of them are uh, members of our church electronically. Others are part uh, of us in so many ways. But help me to greet those thousands that are just tuning in right now. Turn this camera right here and give the Lord praise. Come on, give the Lord praise and thanks. Come on, welcome them to the Apostolic Faith Church. We know that God has sent you to be a part of us. And we believe with all of our hearts that once, everybody say one service in the house of the living God will change your entire life. Now give God praise and thanks for them uh, in the name of the Lord. Oh, thank you. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do without notes and they, they didn't give me any notes this morning. They thought I was on vacation. I'm not in Jesus' name. Uh, oh, they, they went over all that. I'm not going to say anything that good. Red Cross is here uh, on March 27th. We need you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm now putting on another hat because, uh, again, it, it seems like since COVID, we, we really have had a reluctance, people in general, to give blood. What you don't know is that there are young people in my sphere of, of training and, and expertise that need blood that is phenotypically like them. All that means is, even though they can receive blood from anybody, that they do the best because they're chronically transfused. They need blood from African American people. No, no, that's, that's, that's real. And, and so on the 27th, I hope you will join with us, us and be a part of that uh, in the name of the Lord. And then finally, uh, this morning, uh, I got my seventh COVID immunization. Yeah, right there. They said, seven, you don't need all that. Well, first of all, you're not trained to say that. You just think that. But I will tell you this. I was in a conference last week, and we were talking about uh, uh, the spiritual and the secular. And I told them, be very careful when you think that secular things are evil things. 
I, I was trained in uh, oncology in 1975 through 1979. In 1975, the five-year survival for common leukemia for children was only 15%. Today, that same diagnosis, five-year survival, is 97%. Okay, I'm gonna I'm 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 prolong it. Turn your neighbor, neighbor say, say, neighbor, the devil didn't do that. Now give God praise for what he has done through science. So just because it's not somebody speaking in tongues does not mean that's not the Lord. The enemy only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but he has come to give us life. Say life. Life in every aspect. So again, support these things that you may think are not important. They are really important, and you show the love of God by doing that. So again, get, get vaccinated. Right now in our city, we're having to uh, do some things because uh, parents have decided, some of them, not to get their kids immunized to measles. Now I'm gonna tell you, in the next two years, and I'm not trying, I'm not saying this gloatingly, there will be children in this city who are gonna contract measles encephalitis because people thought they didn't need the vaccine. Don't let the devil dupe you. That's crazy. And so protect your children, protect all of us by being vaccinated. Last but not least, uh, what's gonna happen in two days? See, that was too slow. Y'all making me nervous. What must we do by Tuesday? We vote, some of us voted already. I wanted to vote, vote early and often, but I couldn't. But yeah, you need to vote. Please, please do that. Uh, we don't push all catness, but don't you believe the rope-a-dope of people that have decided that black women have too much power? I'm just gonna say it like that. Certain of these races where they have replaced these women. Think about this, three years ago, President of Cook County was a black woman. Mayor of the city of Chicago, black woman. Federal prosecutor, state's attorney, black woman. They have painted that lady as if she was evil. Don't you believe that? Don't you believe that? Don't, don't you believe that a candidate who is committed to hiring 3,000 more police officers is gonna make you safer? If you believe that, I got some swamp land to sell you to. If we don't deal with family and values, I don't care who's the mayor, state's attorney, it's not going to get better. But don't let these people manipulate you to not vote. Okay, I gotta, I've said enough, I gotta say that. V vote on Tuesday. Well, it's offering time at AFC. I, the ushers in the aisles with the envelopes, they're all kind of envelopes. Uh, Jerry, were you supposed to do this offering or was I supposed to do it? I, I, I'm supposed to do it, yeah. So uh, they have all kind of envelopes, but uh, we are a tithing, giving church. Somebody say amen. The one thing that makes me nervous about a day like this is because we've pushed everything to Sunday and it's past this day, but it really is the Lord's day. So support our church uh, as we move forward uh, in giving. We have committed ourselves, again, in our scholarship to go over uh, $200,000 this year in scholarships, and we don't have special offerings. Amen. We give it. Uh, we have committed ourselves to increase uh, our evangelistic outreach. I got a text this morning, again, from Pastor Alex, who is right now in the Ukraine, making sure that the name of Jesus is being publicized during the war. Give God praise for that. He'll be here on next week. We'll be supporting him and others. So again, please support these things. Uh, they tell me if you want to give for Pastor's Day, you can do a yellow envelope. Or you can also give something to AFCP. It's on the screen behind me. Just do that in the name of the Lord. Amen. Come forward, service, as we prepare to give. What an awesome God. Yes. For those who are tuned in by way of all the social media, as you give and sow a seed, the Lord bless you for your support of what we're doing in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, it's with thanksgiving and appreciation we bow our heads this morning. We thank and praise you for being who you said you are. You are Jehovah Jireh. You have already made a way for us out of no way. We are grateful and thankful, and even as we are able now to worship you in our gifts, 
We give them with joy and thanksgiving. We don't give them comparatively, but we give them because we believe it's not equal giving, but it is equal sacrifice. Anoint every gift, no matter what the amount may be. Anoint every giver. Anoint those that want to give and have not the means to give. Let this church emulate you in our stewardship in every area. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.
I thank God for his goodness and his mercy. I give honor to God who is ahead of my life. I'm old school, y'all. He is the keeper and the lover of my soul. And I'm grateful to God today to be, to be here with you to celebrate 44 years of leadership, of sacrifice, of tears, of prayers, of standing on the wall of faith. That is a lifetime, a lifetime. I'm grateful to be home, you all. There is no place like home. There's no place like home, and it's even better when you're invited. So I'm grateful to be here today. Thank you, Sister Smith. I love you for your leadership, for your confidant, for being a friend. Thank you so much for your, your grace. Thank you. We're going to go old school today. I'm going to honor. I am going to honor Bishop. <laughs> with the song and the style, amen. He has requested a hymn, and you know, as you get older, when you're younger, you listen to the hymns and they're just kinda la-di-da, la-di-da. But as you get older, they take on new meaning. Can I get a witness? They take on new meaning. The words mean something, you live some life, and you're able to apply and the, it just warms your heart. So pray for me as I come to you in grace and love and I hope that you can receive what God has given. get happy when I say that name. And oh, for, for grace to trust him more, more. A friend we had 
nothing else I said. Take everything to God in
I'm going to impose. I'm going to impose on the Blue Walton family that uh, I said to somebody if I if I had money 25 years ago, I, I would have bought her contract because no no uh, I, I, I not I, not just talent but divinely called talent and commitment. Um, that's what this church is made of. I, I'm gonna, I, I put her on the spot. She, I said, Angie, I, I just need you to sing if you ever need a friend. She said, I don't know if they know that. They, they'll pick it up. That sticks closer than any brother. I recommend Jesus. I, I recommend Jesus.
will protect you. So the devil can't do you no harm. Wow. How blessed we are. Let's all stand together. I certainly want to acknowledge uh, the first lady, did she leave, of Indiana Avenue Pentecostal Church. Y'all talking about hi, Sister Shirley Moore, wife of Bishop Mark Moore Sr. All of my friends that have tuned in from across the country and want to be here today, but uh, I, am, I am so blessed. We are so blessed. Um, <laughs> wow. 38th Street, can you appreciate the rich gift God gives to us? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have a group of young people and from every demographic in our church who are just waiting to move forward. And, and I, am, I am so proud in a godly way of, of what the Lord is doing. And can you just say with me, say the best. Yes. Say it like you mean, say the best. Is yet to come. Wow. Wow. Yeah, almost 44 years ago, frightened, um, confused, I charged the board of our church at that time who came to me and said, We have been praying and and the Lord told us to talk to you about running for the pastorate. And I told them, I'll say it, I don't care who doesn't like it. I said to them, they were carnal. They were out of order. Sometimes we think we know. But there is one that knows all things. I'm so glad he does not always listen to me, that we are learning to listen to him. Uh, to anybody who aspires to be a pastor, you, you need to understand that the voice of God is clear, but he filters it through people. Those men that I said were out of order were, to my surprise, totally in order. I am humbled that I resisted because I knew the will of God. But again, he does not listen to our feebleness. He calls us by his own will and power. If God loves you, he'll give you leaders and pastors after his own heart. Men and women that are committed to the call of Christ beyond their own need. Uh, I appreciate, again, all those that God has put in my life and allowed me, as my wife told me years ago, I told this story again, won't tell it to you, to the ministers today. My wife said about Bishop Holly and his training, she said, don't let your head get big, but the reason that you're here is because you listen. This is a terrible day when people think they know. When every source is to be believed. I don't believe most sources. You better be careful when you let everybody's opinion guide your life. But God is always faithful. You can find in every demographic, in every group, there are men and women that God has raised up for such a time as this. My wife and I don't take friendships lightly. Uh, the Browns have not been our friends for a long time, but they are very precious to us. Bishop Brown just transitioned the, his major church to his son. Uh, I, I watched that transition, and uh, nothing to you, I, I, I cry easily. It brought me to tears because I didn't realize that his son was not his natural son. And he had already arranged through the judge and the legal system to adopt his son. The reason he had not done it before because he respected his son's biological mother. 
so he would not adopt his son, even though he raised him. And then on that day that he transitioned a couple weeks ago, they signed the documents for him to be his adopted son. It is important to understand the principle of God. I am the God of Ibrahim, of Isaac, and Yaakov. He repeats it in scripture over and over again. I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He is a God of lineage. I ask my ministers all the time, tell me something about, great about Abraham. They can tell you many things about him being the father of faith. Tell me something about Jacob. Oh, he was a trickster. He became Israel. And I said, so tell me something great about Isaac. You cannot tell me one thing in Scripture great about Isaac. Because Isaac represents the son. He, he did not dig any wells of his own. He only unstopped the wells of his father. You don't need to be great in your sight. Just make sure you're in the lineage. See, you missed it. it you, make sure you are, in, you are linked in the image because there are no pop-ups in God. You don't pop up and become, well, okay, I'm not the preacher. I forgot. I, I forgot. Uh, forgive me, Bishop Apostle Brown. Um, we appreciate your sacrifice as you have transitioned to the headship of your organization. You've always been the head of it, but now you have the hands-on responsibility. Your wife uh, is precious to us, Sister Valerie. Give the Lord praise for her. We thank God for her. So he's been here before, and he's back by popular and my demand. Receive the man of God today, Bishop uh, Kim Brown in Jesus' name. Hear ye him. Um, your bishop is correct. About three Sundays ago, after 33 years, um, I passed the mantle to my son. The thing that has been most amazing for me is two things, to see how the church has responded to him and to see how God has responded. Your bishop said so eloquently in language that I cannot speak that God always reminds us he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Bishop, that's my doctoral dissertation, how to establish a multi-generational black church. Because I believe God is telling us that the way I operate is I'm the God of Abraham. That's the season of wandering. I'm the God of Isaac. That's the season of weaning. I'm the God of Jacob. That's the season of wrestling. And there is yet a fourth generation. I'm the God of Joseph. So after you transition through Abraham, which is wandering, all of us have been through these stages where you were just wandering. And then you move to the season of Isaac where God was weaning you. He was taking some stuff away. Then you transitioned into the season of Jacob where you were wrestling. You knew God had something for you, but you were wrestling to find out what it was. After you've survived those three seasons, you move into the season of Joseph, which is the season of winning. You never get to winning first. You get to winning after wondering. 
you get to weaning, wrestling, and then finally winning. Bishop, what's so funny is the son that this morning I saw teaching at our church as the new pastor. When we would take up the offering, we would bring our offering to the altar. He would come to the altar with his timberlands open and the tongue of his timberlands hanging out. After doing I don't know what all night long. And it would take him about five minutes to walk from the back of the church to the front. He would look at me and as if to say, man, I'm here. And then he would walk back and I would see people in the church elbowing each other saying, that's the preacher's son. <laughs> now they're saying that's the pastor. Because in case you haven't wondered, God takes the foolish things of the world and then anoints them to confound the wise. What a marvelous God we serve. Can we put our hands together and bless God for 44 years of Bishop and First Lady? Come on, we can, let's do a 44 year shout. Amen. And before you go to your seat, can you bless God for my bride of 35 years? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Um, I just want to thank you all for letting March come and there's no snow on the ground. Praise God. We were in Orlando last week. It was 85 and sunny every day. We left Orlando to go to Colleen yesterday I preached in Colleen, Texas yesterday. Temperature got a little bit lower in Colleen. And then we red-eyed to Chicago last night. And when I stepped off of that plane, I said under my breath, this is not the will of God for my life. So I just want to let y'all know in a few hours, I will definitely be back in Orlando, where it's 85, and um, First Lady, the golf course is waiting. Our backyard is on Nicholas number six. And around the corner is the Palmer course and the Watson course. God has blessed us. Um, we, we still reside in Virginia, but we hide in Orlando. I tell people all the time, I didn't, I got this from a friend of mine. I'm not retired, I'm just not required. <laughs> Amen. And I'm telling you, there's a good feeling, Bishop. I'm just letting you know it feels good when Monday rolls around and you're not worried about next Sunday having something to say. That's a good feeling. Boy, I have messed around and COVID showed me that God does not have a problem with you playing golf on Sunday. Oh God, it took me 33 years to find out that, that God will bless you to play golf on the Sabbath. It was created for rest. And so I'm just grateful to God for, um, I told Elder, and I want you all to understand I'm a basketball enthusiast. Last week was the MEAC tournament in Norfolk, Virginia. I have a special parking space at the convention center so I don't have to worry about parking. I just call and tell them I'm coming to the game. I back into the space and um, my wife decided we were going to be on our way to Chicago and miss the championship. She accepted this engagement. I just want to let y'all know, my wife comes in and she says, oh yeah, you're doing Bishop Hart Smith's anniversary. I said, I am? And she said, yeah, First Lady Susan called today and um, I told her, yeah, we'll be there. 
I said, you do know that's the MEAC Tournament Championship that Saturday night. She said, yeah, I told them we'll come in that Saturday night. I said, you do know the championship game is that Saturday evening. I had planned on being, so my son called me. He said, Dad, I heard you in Chicago, so just go ahead and Ticketmaster me those seats that you got. He said, just because you got to work doesn't mean I can't go to the game. You and so um, after 35 years now, she accepts. And, and it's amazing because when, that's how I got started in ministry. I was running from my call. And my mother, um, bless her heart, she'd come home and say, you're doing, you're doing Zion Bethel's youth revival next week. I said, Mama, nobody called me. She said, oh, no, I saw him at work. And they said they needed somebody to preach. I told them, my boy can preach. She would come home and say, you know you're doing Reverend Jones's Men's Day, second Sunday in June. Mama, ain't nobody from Reverend Jones Church called me. She said, oh, no, I went on and told them they were looking for somebody. I told them my, my son is a preacher. So I guess life has gone full circle now. <laughs> my wife came home and said, you just, you, I want you to know you're preaching an apostolic. Uh, okay, thank you. So, so let me go ahead and just ask, where am I next Sunday? You know what I mean? Since you're working all this out, can you just tell me? I, I, am, I, take, I take it very personal when a church wants to celebrate the legacy of pastor. Y'all need to add something else. A few, and I got this a few, year, a few weeks ago. Um, my retirement moment was in the convention center. And I, I just got emotional because 7,000 folks showed up to say goodbye. It was just... It just blew, I mean, I sat there, and then Bishop Jakes walks out, and you know, he's the preacher, and I'm sitting there saying, you know, man, it was, Pastor Mike is doing the music, you know, so it was just overwhelming. And the thing that they shouted the most on was 33 years with no scandal. Now, before you go there, if they shouted for 33 years and no scandal, in Chesapeake. Y'all ought to lose your mind in Chicago for 44 years and no scat. That's the best shout cue I got for you all day right there. Woo, God. Yes, God. There's a whole lot of pastors that have been married as long as he has. But there's not a whole lot of pastors that have been married as long as he has to one woman. And he is, he is just like Elder and I. If you see him, you're going to see her. And if you see her, you're going to see him. I tell you, I used to, well, I'm not the pastor anymore, but I used to tell Mount Lebanon, if they tell you I had an affair, it was a threesome. Because she was there. I won't there by myself, because wherever I go, she's there. And wherever she goes, I'm there. So get the rumor straight. <laughs> because my wife told me the first day, she said, I don't do no affairs. She said, I'll ride with you. We can handle whatever comes up. She said, but you ain't going to get no do-over. She said, and First Lady Susan, she said to me, she said, my best friend is the juvenile domestic court judge in the city. She said, so not only are you not going to get a do-over, when we finish with you, you won't have anything left but your underwear. She said, I'm going to take it all. Cars, trucks, the dog, everything going with me. She said, now you can go on out there and get tricked if you want to, but I'm just, I'm just letting you know how it's going to ride right here. She said, you know me, I'm from the hood. I'm coming for everything. She said, I hope she got a good house because you're going to need somewhere to live. I'm, let's get to the word, y'all. Let's get to the word. Girl scared me so bad. And you know, I was from, I was from, my mom and daddy would go to blows. 
So, you know, I thought that was normal. So the first time we had a disagreement, we were in the kitchen, and she was sitting in the kitchen chairs, and the chairs had casters on them. And she said something, and I said something, and I kicked that chair, and that chair rolled across the kitchen floor when she rose up. It was like a scene from The Exorcist. Her head started spinning around. She said, you have lost, and I, this is when you know a woman has gone to another dimension. She said, she said, you have lost your ever-loving mind. My daddy don't even hit me, so we gonna get this straight right now. Cause if I let this slide, you gonna think this is acceptable behavior. Every time we had a disagreement from then on, I put my hands behind my back. I was like, oh no, this woman looked like the kind that'll pull some hot grits on you or something. No, 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 no. Baby, I love you. Yes, God. Jeremiah chapter 3. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, I'm, I'm sure the good doctor down there would diagnose me as bipolar. I can go from right here all the way over there in a moment. So let's get serious. Jeremiah chapter 3, starting with verse 15. Look at somebody and tell them it is Bishop's anniversary. Verse 15 through 16, I love this text. This pericope just really blesses me. It says, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall no more, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. Look at your neighbor real quick and just say, make it personal. Look at someone else and just tell them, make it personal. Father, I pray that when you are finished talking, I take my seat in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all ever watched uh, something on television and when they get ready to show it to you, they tell you, now don't try this at home. So as a precursor to the story that I will use to introduce the preaching moment, I need you to look at your neighbor and tell them, don't try this at home. True story, the names have not been changed to protect the innocent because Bishop Larry Manning is going to be with the Lord now. I was preaching for him in Valdosta, Georgia a few years ago. We're staying at his home, First Lady Susan, and that morning we get up and we're having breakfast. I'm thinking, you know, I'm the guest in the house, so they're gonna probably take my wife and I around the city and show us sights. He said, Bishop, I'm sorry, but I've got a jet out and I'm gonna leave you here for a few hours until I come back. First, Thing I'm thinking is how rude of him to have me in his house and now he's gonna leave me in his crib where I don't know anything don't know where the light switches are and he says but I'll be back by lunchtime well I need an explanation you know I'm your guest you're being quite rude you're gonna leave me and run somewhere and tell me to just sit here until you come back. So I said, Bishop, where are you going? He said, well, I've got to go to court with one of the mothers of the church. So, you know, I got a little bit more settled then. You know, I'm like, oh yeah, we got to take care of the seasoned saints. He said, yeah, I'm going to court with her because she's been charged with assault and battery. <laughs> now I get even more concerned. He's telling me that one of the mothers of his church Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't try this at home. Don't try this at home. One of the mothers of his church, the lady that wears the little white thing on her head, 
one of the mothers of the church, the lady that will point at you if you're chewing gum and tell you, come, spit it out. One of the mothers in the church, one of the ladies that surrounds you when you're getting saved so you can get baptized with the Holy Ghost. One of the mothers of the church, the ladies who wear the long, thick brown stockings and, and the long dress that one of the mothers of the church that will give you the look from the pew when you're singing in the choir and make your back straighten up. One of the mothers of the church is accused and charged with assault and battery. So he comes back home a few hours later. He says, okay, Bishop, let's go eat some lunch. I said, no, Bishop, you got to sit down. You got to sit down. Tell me the story about the mother in the church getting charged with assault and battery and what happened in court. He said, well, well, we went to court today. He said, mother was charged with assault and battery. And um, here's how it went down. He said, she was, I don't know if I need to go middle class or I can go ghetto. I can go both ways. If you middle class, she was in the hair salon. If you are ghetto, she was in the beauty parlor. Whichever one you need me to say, she was in the beauty parlor sitting under the dryer. True story. Names have not been changed to protect the innocent. Um, she's sitting under the dryer and she overhears some of the ladies in the beauty parlor talking about her pastor and her church. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I see that rising up. I forgot. Oh, Lord Jesus. I forgot I'm in Chicago. Okay, look at your neighbor and tell them, don't try this at home now. Don't try this at home. So she raises up the bulb of the hair dryer and simply walks over to the lady and said, ma'am, I don't know you, but you're talking about my pastor and my church, and I'm just very respectfully asking you to change the subject. She goes back over, grabs her jet magazine, pulls the bulb back down over her head, and continues to dry her hair. She hears the lady one more time continue the conversation. True story, names have not been changed to protect the innocent. They pull the helmet up of the dryer, and she goes over and says, now, I told you, listen to the language. Her language is um, accelerating. She said, now, I've asked you to take my pastor and my church out of your mouth. Now the language, you know, when she go to, I've told you to take them out of your mouth. It's going, you can see it's accelerating. Elbow your neighbor and tell him it's accelerating. She puts the dryer back down, goes back to getting her hair done, and the ladies continue to dialogue negatively about her church and her pastor. Here it is, I don't want to bore you. She raises up. Bishop, Bishop Manning says that's when the conversation with the judge gets interesting because she says to the judge, I really don't know what happened after that moment because I blacked out. She said, the next thing I know, the popo is there and he's handcuffing me and saying I have slapped the lady on the other side of the beauty parlor. She said, Your Honor, I don't know if I really slapped her or not, but in defense, I want you to know I warned her three times to not talk about my church or my pastor. The judge then says, Is your pastor here? So Bishop Manning comes up. He was a well dressed, um, stately brother. He goes up to the podium, and the judge says, Are you her pastor? He says, yes, sir, I am. He says, well, you do know she's got an anger problem. <laughs> he said, yes, Your Honor, we've been trying to help her with her anger problem. We know, true story, absolutely true story. And so the judge says, well, do you do any kind of counseling? He said, yes, sir, Your Honor, I do counseling. I do counseling at the church. He said, well, do you do anger management counseling? And the bishop said, yes, sir, I do anger management counseling. Here's where it gets so funny. He says, okay, sir, you can have your seat. He says, I want the accused to stand one more time. He said, I'm ready to pass sentence on you now. And he says to her, I'm going to sentence you to six months of anger management counseling. 
You will go to counseling every Sunday morning. What time is worship, Bishop? And the bishop said, 11 o'clock, he said, your, your sentence is for the next six months, you will go to anger management counseling at New Life Church in Valdosta, Georgia at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning. That's what your sentence is. He said, I was blown away that the judge charged the lady guilty and then told her to come to church every Monday, every Sunday for the next six months. He said, what really turned, here it is, what really turned the heart of the judge was when she stood up and said, Your Honor, I'm not usually a violent person, but you got to understand when I stumbled into new life, I had a substance problem. And that particular Sunday, this man stood up and started to preach. And as he began to preach, I lost my taste for wild Irish roads. I lost my taste for cigarettes. I lost my taste for anything other than the Holy Ghost. And so it is, here it is, personal for me. Would you look at somebody and tell them, make it personal, make it personal, make it personal, make it personal. Point at somebody else and tell them, don't, don't, don't put my pastor in your mouth. It's personal for me. Would you look at somebody sitting three rows up and tell them, don't talk about my church. It's personal for me. Find somebody five rows back that have missed the whole story and tell them, I'm warning you right now, the same spirit that was in Valdosta is subject to rise up in Chicago. I've got to make this thing personal. Holler at your boy if you feel like I'm going to talk to you a little bit. I believe that Jeremiah is giving us a scriptural foundation for those of us that know this relationship is personal. Let me see if I can help you to understand that the first thing that we've got to learn if we're going to make it personal is that the pastor is a prepared gift. Three claps on the right side, y'all sleep on the left side. I'm, I'm going to give you a second chance because I'm a man of grace. He's a prepared gift. The Bible says, according to Jeremiah, Bishop, he says, I will give you, give you. Let me see if I can help you to understand that theologically, um, um, Jesus is a gift to the sinner. Holy Spirit is a gift to believers. Pastor is a gift to a church. Bishop is a gift to the church. Okay, maybe that was a little too deep. Y'all clap for the left side. Jesus is a gift to the sinner. For God so loved the world that he Holy Spirit is a gift to the believer. Pastors are a gift to a church. Bishops are a gift to the church. The, the reason why we don't make it personal sometimes is because we don't realize the pastor is a prepared gift for me. I got a story I think that'll help us to sum it up. Every Christmas, shout at me Christmas. Every Christmas, every Christmas, my, my mother would show up at our house or oh, at some ungodly hour in the morning because she was overwhelmingly excited about Christmas. She would have all the latest toys. She would have bought out the toy store for her grandchildren, and she would bring so many toys to the house that we would take some of the toys and put them in the attic for, for good grades on a report card and birthdays for the rest of the year because we didn't want our children to receive all those gifts at one time. Bishop, here's what's so amazing. That afternoon, my father-in-law and my mother-in-law would show up at the house, no toys. He didn't buy toys. He didn't buy toys. He didn't buy toys. He would show up. My mother-in-law would show up, and she would give the children, here it is, she's from Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, clean underwear, because you know she's from, she's from the old school. She would always tell you when you're getting ready to go out the house, put on some clean underwear just in case you get in an accident. 
you get hit by a car or something, we want you to have on clean underwear. I get hit by a car, I'm not going to be worried about my underwear. But that's, that's, a, that's for another day. That's for another day. My father-in-law would always hand, he was a postal worker, he would hand our children envelopes. My grandchildren would say, thanks, granddaddy, we know what this is, a government savings bond. $100 that we can't spend right now. We can only take it to the bank and put it in the safety deposit box. Elbow your neighbor and tell him he's setting you up and you don't even realize you're being set up. So he would do that for every birthday, every honor roll, every Christmas gift, and they would repeat the same thing. Thank you, granddaddy, some underwear and a government savings bond. It was a great gift. They just didn't understand the value of the gift yet. Okay, I'm going somewhere. And watch this. Until my daughter graduated from high school and was on her way to North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University to get her degree, and the university gives her a full ride, but she still got to take care of um, some room fees and some dorm fees and some book fees. And then we took her to the bank, first lady, and we opened the safety deposit box up, and we pulled out 18 years of honor roll, 18 years of birthdays, 18 years of Christmas and she said granddaddy thank you for preparing this gift for me I need about three people on your road that'll look at somebody and tell them he ain't just a preacher he is a prepared gift God knew what I needed 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 God knew I needed somebody that would shoot me straight God knew I needed somebody that would carry me to the word the reason it's personal is because, number one, the pastor is a prepared gift. I will give you not who you want, but pastors after my heart. I know what you need. You don't really understand the value of a pastor until you need to get a prayer through and you're sick. You don't really understand the value of a praying pastor until you are going through something on your job or in your community and it is the agreement and the prayers. That's why the Bible says if any among you are sick, let them call for the elders. There, There's a principle there. He's a prepared gift. How many people in here will testify that you struggled and stumbled into apostolic faith one Sunday and this man stood up and the words that came out of his mouth arrested you. You elbowed your husband or your wife and wanted to know, have you talked to him? No, they ain't talked to him. The Holy Ghost had talked to him and told him what you needed to hear. Shout it real quick. Prepare again. So I said, not only is it personal because he's a prepared gift, but secondly, he's a prophetic guy. He's a prophetic guy. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. In verse 15, he says, now, I'm going to give you pastors, give, after my own heart, here it is, who shall feed you. That's how I knew I had the right assignment because the choir came up here singing about shepherds that feed you right. I want you to understand I'm not saying he's a prophet. He has not told me that he's a prophet. But every pastor has to have a prophetic tone. Why? Because it says sheep know their shepherd's voice. There is something when it comes out of his mouth that it is so prophetic that 15 people can hear the same sermon and all 15 of them get a different revelation. Because God blesses the pastor to be able to speak to the masses, but speak to you particularly. Okay, let me see if I can help you with this. I'll never forget, I'm a storyteller. I believe Jesus um, preached the gospel through parables, so I like using stories. I've got a gentleman in my church named Dan Bannister. Dan is an interesting guy. He's 6'9". He played college basketball. If you've ever seen the movie where Whoopi Goldberg is the coach of the New York Knicks, if you look on the bench, you'll see Dan Bannister. Well, well here's what's so amazing. Dan was the general manager of a Nissan dealer in our city. And, and so then 
then I'm riding down the street one day and God says, I need you to turn into the dealership. Now, God will tell me to do some ghetto stuff. And, and I'm like, God, you're going to get a brother hurt. You know, so, so he said, I need you to just turn into the dealership. You go in and ask to speak to Mr. Bannister, who's the general manager, and you tell him this. What profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? I said to God, when I roll up in there, he going to call security or somebody, and they're going to drag me out of the dealership, and I'm going to be all over the news. I go in. I say, hey, I need to speak to Mr. Bannister. I talk to him. They send me, take me upstairs to his office. I walk into his office. He got all this NBA paraphernalia everywhere. I said, uh, Mr. Bannister, how you doing? My voice was kind of shaky because when you walk in in fear, your voice, your voice will interpret your fear. I said, Mr. Bannister, um, um, God told me to come in here. God told me to come in here. God, you know, I said that about five times. God told me to come in here because I just want to know, you know, wanted him to know if you're going to get mad at somebody. Jehovah told me to come in here. So, so, so don't take it out on me. I am that I am told me to come in here. You know, I ain't coming here because of me. I came in here because I'm trying to make sure I stay right with I am that I am. I ain't going to let you cause me to miss my blessing. And so he said, well, what did God tell you to say? I said, God told me to tell you what profit a man to lose to gain the whole world and lose his soul. And I stood back because the brother 6'9", I ain't know how he was going to respond. He said, I hear you. I'm like, that's all you got is I hear you? And I walk out. Well, the next Sunday, I see Mr. Bannister come in church with his wife and his family. He's 6'9", so when we're doing praise and worship and he's standing up, he's standing up over top of everybody else. I'm feeling pretty good. Then I'm like, okay, I must have a little prophetic juice in me too. I went down there and told the man he needed to get himself straight. Here he is in church today. I almost got my Joyce Jefferson on right in the pulpit. I'm feeling pretty good. Now, here's what's so amazing. I'm going somewhere. I promise you, tolerate me just for a moment. So a few weeks later, he's volunteering with the media ministry. So now he's running around church with a camera on, taking pictures. I'm like, oh, snap. He ain't going to work up in the church now. Six, nine, working in the church. You know, everybody like, and he's, he's on all the TV commercials. He's branded himself as Dan the Man. So, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So they're like, man, Dan the Man done joined our church. Dan the Man in there taking pictures. And I'm going, I ain't going to lie. I'm telling the preachers too, Dan the Man done joined our church now, man. You know, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, we got it rolling over there, Dan Bannister, you know, Dan the man gonna join our church, yeah, bro. He working in the church, yeah, he up in there taking pictures and stuff, taking pictures every Sunday, taking pictures. And then, then watch this, true story, y'all, true story. And so, so what happens is he goes to the dealership and the owner of the dealership says, we're going to start opening on Sunday morning. He said, ain't no problem. He said, what I'll do is I just got in church and my family's in church now. So what I'll do is I'll go to church in the morning and then I'll serve and I'll come to the dealership that afternoon. The owner says, oh, no, you got to be there first thing on Sunday morning. Dan says, no, you don't understand. I just started getting in church, and this thing is important to me. It's personal. Okay, you just missed a turn. He said, and I want you to understand, I got to be in the house of the Lord. My children are singing in the, in the children's choir and all this. He said, and then I'll come to work after that. The, dealer, the owner of the dealership says, either you report or find somewhere to work. So he comes back to me. He says, Bishop, I want to let you know the owner of the dealership and I are at an impasse. He said, can you pray for me? I said, yes, sir, I'll pray for you. I got on my knees, prayed, and the Lord, I promise you, the Lord said, what you need to do is tell him, read the story of Joseph. I'm still on point two, prophetic God. I called Dan up. I said, Dan, the Lord told me to tell you to read the story of Joseph. He said, okay, Pastor. A few hours later, he called me back. He said, I'm confused. So are you telling me that just like Joseph got run out of the city and then came back running everything in the city, that that's what's going to happen to me? I'm going to get run out of the dealership, and then I'm going to come back owning everything in the dealership? I said, Dan, I can't say that. All God told me to tell you to do is read the story of Joseph. Oh, God, shout cue on the way. It was about three months later that Dan called me and said, Bishop, you ain't gonna believe this. I got the checkbook for the dealership under my arm. I just bought the whole dealership. He said, I'm going back in there tomorrow as the owner. He said, when I walk in, can you walk in with me? I walked in just like I was George Jefferson. I need about eight of you that'll look at somebody and tell them, keep his name out of your mouth because when he opens his mouth, he has prophetic utterance 
that can push me into my destiny. Anybody here know that God can use him to push you? Oh, I feel a praise moment right there. Look at somebody tell him, his words push me into my promotion, push me into my growth, push me into my healing, push me into my overflow. He's a prophetic God. He feeds me. Watch this, watch this. Y'all, if y'all shout now, y'all gonna, y'all gonna lose your mind in a minute. This brother, Bishop, I can't tell the whole story, but now he owns four dealerships, five different brands. This is how he now buys his dealerships. Y'all ready for this? I have never been in the car business in my life, but I love cars. God gonna mess around and sent the crack dealer to my church. Cars are my crack, and I got somebody that owns four of them with five brands. I love when my car needs service. I call up to the dealership, say, hey, this is Bishop. I'm bringing my car in, man. It needs to get the tires rotated. They said, Bishop, we'll have something ready for you to drive. I'm driving all of his cars for free. <laughs> but, but that ain't the shout cue. Here's the shout cue. So when we go in to dedicate the first dealership, we go into the owner's office, and Dan gets emotional when he looks at the shower. Because he said, Bishop, when they built the office, the plumbers made a mistake on the shower head and put the shower head at seven feet two inches. He said, and the owner fussed me out. Why would you let them put the shower head so high? He said, now I understand it was never his shower in the first place. I wish I had three people in here that would look at somebody and tell them, I got a feeling God is getting ready to push me somewhere. There's some stuff that he is prepared. Okay, okay, okay. Y'all sit down. Y'all sit down, Apostolic. I got to go. Don't y'all make me be late. 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 Look at somebody and tell them, I'm going to sit down after I get this last stomp in because I feel like God is doing something prophetic in my life and he uses my vision to confirm and affirm what he's already telling me. So the reason it's personal is number one, because the pastor is a prepared gift. But number two, because the pastor is a prophetic guide. But then thirdly, the pastor is a productive guard. There's a reason why the crozier that you see your bishop carry has a hook on one end, and on the other end, there would be a point. The hook is to save sheep that have fallen over the cliff. But the point is to fight off the wolves that would come to attack the flock. Boy, I better leave that alone. I felt Chesapeake rise up in me right then. True story, true story. Look at your neighbor and tell him one more story and he out. One more story and he out. I'm at home one night. It's about 1230. One of the men in our church calls me and says, Pastor, I got a problem. I said, okay, what's the problem? I'm trying to be real pastor. What's the problem? He said, well, um, there's a warrant out for my arrest, and I don't know what to do. Now, in the back of my mind, I thought, what a dumb question to ask. There's a warrant out for your arrest, and you don't know what to do. And you calling me. So I said, I don't understand. He said, what should I do? I said, well, what are your options? He said, well, I can just leave town. <laughs> well, now you have made me an accessory to this dumb idea you got. I'm like, come on, bro, don't put me out there because I'm too pretty to go to prison. I know, I know this ain't the will of God. Y'all, y'all, brother ain't got no low self-esteem when it comes down. I'm like, no, nah, I know I ain't set up. I'm a buck 90. I ain't set up for going to no prison. I'm two packs of Marlboro in prison. I'm like, oh, no. Some of y'all, oh, man, some of y'all so holy. You, okay, okay, I'm going to leave that alone. If I said that in Chesapeake, one of my delivered inmates would have got up and started running across. Okay, okay. So he says, I said, I said, I said, what you got to do is you got to turn yourself in. So now, you know, and I'm going to do the pastoral thing. Talking about pastor's anniversary. So, you know, I said, come on, let's pray. 
And I pray, I call, you know, I'm like, my job gonna be over after I say amen. It's on you then, go turn yourself in. And I pray, amen, Lord, we believe in for, you know, you to take care of the judge and bless the heart of the judge. And, and God, make the officers that arrest him sensitive to respecting his masculinity and, you know, send him to prison and you know I'm going real religious on him now just like you had David and all the rest of the boys locked up and you went into prison you went into prison and got Paul and Silas out of the prison I started preaching on the phone now God is midnight but you know you do special things at midnight you know I'm going all in and I say amen he said he said Bishop I got one more request I said what's that he said can you go with me In the back of my mind, I'm like, God, I ain't signed up for this right here. One old class in seminary, how do you go with somebody to turn themselves in to the popo? This is the real religious side. I picked up on that. So I'm going to talk to y'all. In the back of my mind, you know what I'm thinking? I ain't trying to go down there and they pull my picture up and find out this. I wish I had some real worshipers in here. I'm like, no, I don't need to go down there. The man be going to ask me for my social security number and then some stuff come up on me? <laughs> no, bro, ask for me in my house. We're going to serve the Lord, but you're going down there by yourself. So, so, so I tell him, okay, okay. Boy, I'm messing y'all, 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 y'all laughing, but I'm taking you somewhere. So in the morning, in the morning, I said, man, we'll meet, we'll meet in front of precinct number one. Be there at nine o'clock. He said, okay, Bishop, I'll see you in the morning. I get there, because you know, when you're messing with the police, I get there at 8.45. I get there early. I told him 9 o'clock, I'm, I'm outside precinct number one where the police chief office is, and I'm walking out front like this. I'm nervous. I ain't did nothing, and I'm nervous. I'm scared to death. He got to turn himself in. I'm sweating and everything, and, and my knees are knocking, and I'm scared. And after a while, the deputy chief comes out and says, hey, Bishop, good morning. I said, hey, how you doing? He said, um, chief sent me out here. I said, okay. He said, Chief said, see Bishop out there. Go see what Bishop needs. I said, uh, tell Chief, I'm okay, but one of my men got messed up. I ain't messed up. Get the record straight. I'm good. But one of my men, there's a capius out for him, and he's going to turn himself in, and I'm going to meet him here this morning in a few minutes. I'm still pacing. Deputy chief goes back in. About five minutes later, Bishop, the deputy chief comes back out and says, um, chief sent me out here to tell you when your, when your member gets here, tell them don't go around to the magistrate door to turn himself in. Tell them stand right with you. I said, what you mean? He said, tell them stand right beside you. I said, okay. He said, now, you make sure you tell him, don't drive around the side of the building and turn himself in. Tell him to stand right beside you, slow class. He said, stand right beside you. So when he gets there, his wife drops him off. I said, man, I don't know what's going on, but the police chief told me to tell you when you get here, don't go around the side and turn yourself into the magistrate. You just stand right here. So here we are, two black men standing in front of precinct number one. We just standing out there. We don't know why we're standing out there, but we're standing out there. He said, Bishop, I don't know why I'm standing out here. I feel like I need to go around there. But if my pastor told me to stand right here, I'm going to stand where my pastor, y'all just missed it. He said, he said I, know, I know I'm supposed to go around the corner. He said, but my pastor told me to stand right here beside me. I'm talking to all those folk that have tried to talk you out of your position here at Apostolic. You need to send them an email and say, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to stand right next to First Lady Susan and Bishop. I'm going to stand right here. And so here's what so amazing as we're standing there a black car rolls up the black car rolls up and they pull the window down and they say are you Bishop Brown I said yes sir he said tell your member get in the car I said get in the car he said am I supposed to get in the car I said get in the car he said do you know where they're taking me I said no get in the car he said do you know what they're gonna do I said no get in the car he said how am I gonna make out I said I don't know I ain't never been arrested but the man told me to tell you get in the car listen to your pastor listen to your pastor 
he gets in the car and I drive back down the street to the church office. I'm sitting in my office about 30 minutes later and somebody is knocking on my window. I roll the shade up and it's my member. I go to the door, I say, man, what happened? He said, I turned myself in, but the magistrate said, because of who my pastor was, he was going to release me on your, on your record. I need about eight of you that'll look at somebody and tell them my pastor is a God for me. When the enemy comes in, he uses him to take some of the warfare. I wonder how many days he took the attack for you. I wonder how many attacks he took and first lady took, but it was really set up for you. Shout at your boy and say, thank you, pastor. Oh, God. So the reason why it's personal the reason why it's personal, and I'm out. Thank you so much, Apostolic Bishop. Thank you for letting me come back. I must not have flunked too bad the first time. I got a second opportunity to come through. The reason why you can't put his name in your mouth, and the reason why I'm not going to let you say something about my church is because, number one, he's my prepared gift. God knew what I needed. He knew the kind of voice that I needed to become all that God has called me to be. Do I have anybody in here that'll look at somebody and tell them he's a gift to me? And all I got to do is make sure I honor the gift. When I honor the gift, God starts to honor me. When I honor the gift, God starts to honor me. God gave him to me. The greatest insult to God is when I don't appreciate the gift that God gave me. It's all right for the board and the staff to appreciate him. But if you sitting in the middle, you ought to appreciate him too because he is a gift to you. Can you shout gift? He's a gift. He's a gift. He's a prepared gift. Then he's a prophetic guide. God will put words in his heart that will rise up and cross his vocal cord. And when they come out of his mouth, they will arrest me in the season that I'm in, wherever I am. How many of you in the room will testify that there have been times when he's given you some advice and all you did is go and follow his advice? You might not have agreed with it. You might not even understood it, but he's a prophetic guy. I need about three of you on the left side that'll point at him and say, just keep speaking, Bishop. Just keep speaking. Just keep giving us direction. Keep serving the Lord so that we can look at you. That's why the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ, because he knows some of us need somebody that we can look at. If you want to know how you treat your wife, Look at how he treats his wife. If you want to know how to raise your children, look at how well his children have done. If you want to know how to love the Lord, look at how he cries and praises God. If you want to know how to be a man that pursues, look at how he, get, he goes after his academics and how he blesses the lives of other folk. I'm getting ready to say goodbye to you. I've been up here too long. He's a prepared gift. Then he's a prophetic guy. Then he's a productive God. When the enemy would come in against you, you, you've got a shepherd standing there that says, if you want one of my sheep, you're going to have to come through me. If you're going to come after them, you're going to have to pick me off first. Do I have anybody in here that'll get up on their feet and begin to give God glory because you realize you don't have a howling over here. you got a shepherd over here. A howling is after the money, but a shepherd is after your heart. And howling is after attention. But a shepherd is after affirmation. A howling is after recognition. But a shepherd is after relationship. He just wants you to love God. He just wants you to know who God is. He wants you to know what God has a desire for your life. Is there anybody in here that will give God glory? Because you know that if it had not been for the words in this man's mouth, that came out, you would have blown your brains out by now. If it had not been for the word that was in his mouth, you would have thrown in the towel long ago. Thanks be unto God that he loved me so much that he gave me a man that was raised right across the street. I feel like giving God glory because when I think about the goodness of the Lord and all he's done for me, my soul cries out. Stop. On my way back to Florida, I want you to know you got to make this thing personal. You got to make it a one-on-one -on -one relationship because he's a prepared kid. He's a prophetic guy. He's a productive God. But then
then he's a provisional gate. I used to think this scripture was bipolar because it starts off talking about the preacher. Then he says, when your houses get full and when your land is populated and when everything starts to happen, you won't even think about the good old days because you'll be living so well. And it dawned on me that God was using the past as an opportunity for me to move into another level. As I bless him, God will bless me. As I honor him, God will honor me. Do I have anybody in here that's ready to give God glory? I dare you to get up on your feet, stretch your hand to this great man of God, and say, Pastor, I want to thank you for showing me how to live life more abundantly. I want to thank you for serving 44 years. I want to thank you for not running away from the challenge. I want to thank you for hearing the vision of the Lord. Is there anybody in here that'll give God glory? If you know he's been good, then bless the Lord. If you know he's worthy, then give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Look at somebody and tell them, make it personal. Now, I'm getting ready to leave. And I just feel like God would have me to do this. I know you all have already given. I know the board has already given. You can sit if you desire. I'm not going to be long. But here's... Here's where I was going with the story of Mr. Bannister. So now, Bishop, when he gets ready to buy a new dealership, this is what he'll do. He'll call me at the church and say, Bishop, are you busy? I said, Dan, I'm free after so-and-so hour. He said, well, I'm going to swing through and pick you up. I need you to ride with me. It's okay. So we'll ride to a dealership that nobody even knows is for sale. And he'll say, I need you to get out at the corner and just go walk the grounds of the dealership. He said, now I'll pick you up down at the other corner because I don't want them to know that I'm thinking about buying it. And I'll walk across the dealership and then he'll pick me up. And he said, what you think, Bishop? And I always start by saying, Dan, you know I know nothing about the car business. So this last time I got in and he said, I ain't even got to ask you. I can look at the expression on your face that I'm not supposed to buy that dealership. He calls the broker on the car phone and says, hey man, I just want to let you know. I'm not going to put in an offer on the dealership. And I could hear the guy saying, why, Mr. Bannister, we believe it fits your market. You know, the way you do business, it will, it will do. He said, you don't understand, man. I didn't get a witness. Now, the, now the, the, the banker, the banker didn't even understand that language. You didn't get a witness? He said, I ain't want to tell the guy. My pastor told me not to mess with it. So, First Lady Susan, I guess about a year ago, one of the local bankers calls me, tells me who he is. He said, somebody told me that Mr. Bannister belongs to your church. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, would you do me a favor, Reverend, and connect us because I want to do his financing for his dealerships. So I said, okay. So I take him to the country club. I said, hey, Dan, this is so-and-so, so-and-so, this is Dan. I'm out because I got a tea time. Y'all go ahead and do what y'all got to do. So before I leave, I'm sitting there, and the banker is doing a roll call of all the dealerships that he finances. He's like, well, you know, I do all the inventory for so-and-so, and I do all the inventory for so-and-so. And then he says, Mr. Bannister, who does your inventory? He said, Nissan North America. He said, no, I'm not asking you which brand you sell. Who puts up the capital 
for you to have inventory on the lot. He said, Nissan, North America. The banker said, wow, nobody gets that kind of deal. He said, I don't have a client where the manufacturer puts up capital for their inventory. He said, how in the world are you getting that kind of situation? Dan said, the man right here. The banker said, I don't understand. He said, well, here's what I, when I got my first dealership, I made God a promise that there would never be a vision or a dream in this man's heart that I wouldn't be the first person to give to. He says, so what I've learned is the more he dreams, the more dealerships I get. He said, because as God increases his vision, he's, he's given me the pro. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you were running three seconds ago. He said, I've learned now that the reason why God keeps giving me more is because he's got more dreams in his heart. And somebody's got to help finance the dreams. Y'all, I'm telling you the exact 100% true. We had a dealer in the area call him and say, tell me which dealership you want that I own out of the state because we got to get you out of the state. He said, because you selling cars so quick that the rest of us are losing volume because of you. So I'll pay you to leave. He said, man, you can't pay me to leave unless my pastor leaving. He said, because you don't understand. He's a gate. Watch this, y'all. Yes, yes. Turn to your neighbor and tell him yes. He's getting ready to take up an offering. Yes, yes. One of the scriptures that we misquote the most, I believe, in the body of Christ is your gift will make room for you. So you be in the choir and they know you can sing and you be like, and they'll say, baby, don't worry, you're going to be leading songs after a while because your gift will make room for you. That's terrible interpretation. That is not what that scripture is saying. That scripture is saying your giving will make room for you and bring you before kings. That's what that scripture is saying. Go home and do word study on the word gift there. It's not talking about your ability to sing and all that. It's talking about how you give. So, so Elder and I are going to start giving today for First Lady Susan and Bishop with a thousand dollars. Now, watch this. That ain't no, that ain't no brag. No, you know, um, you know. I'm not saying that to um, boast. Um, I've just learned that everything that has ever happened in my life that was significant, I can track it to a moment of giving. Everything, everything, every significant move in my life. I'm not going to tell you how much. Um, I think ushers and doorkeepers have yellow envelopes. I think they're going to put a code. They've got it up on the screen. Let me take this check out. Amen. I would have probably wanted to do 500, but I don't control the checkbook. So it's a thousand. I'm going to say something that sounds very, very presumptuous. People come to our church in Virginia all the time. Virginia is not Chicago. The population of our city, I want you to hear these numbers, the population of our city is 243,000 people. 243,000 people live in the city of Chesapeake. Let's, let's drill down a little further. And 20% of them look like me. So in my city, that means there are about 40,000 African Americans. And yet our church is about 9,000 members. Now once again, this ain't, this ain't, I'm not saying that to be arrogant or presumptuous at all. 
I'm not that good. You've already learned. If you didn't learn anything else today, I'm, I'm sure the great doctor has already analyzed me. The more nervous I am, the funnier I am. Humor is my defense mechanism for my nervousness. That's the way I have to deliver the gospel because I get so intimidated when they hand me the mic. I was begging the choir to come sing another song and then Bishop turned and said, Bishop Kimbrough, I'm like, can y'all sing one more song? I'm sitting over here, I'm sweating. I prayed about 14 times, Lord, don't let me get up there and make a fool out of myself because the more nervous I am, the funnier I become. And what I've learned is, they tell me all the time, man, Bishop, I got comedians in the church. They're like, Bishop, let's do a show together. I'm like, you don't understand. I will flop. If you just give me the mic and it's a comedy show, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be terrible because I need to be in an environment that intimidates me because when I'm intimidated, my defense mechanism looks like I'm very confident. But it's really humor softening up my nerves. And so I want you to understand that I don't even raise offerings, especially in places where I don't think the leader deserves it. But let me tell you something. If there's ever a man of integrity that I have met and a woman of integrity that I've ever met, it is Horace and Susan Smith. What's so amazing about this moment, I said it when I was here last time, is I used to watch him on TV, and I probably didn't even hear First Lady Susan, his sermon, because I would be through after it said he was a medical doctor. I'm like, man, I can't sing. I can't play an instrument. I don't have a sweet tone in my, my cadence when I'm closing. And this man is a doctor. Come on, God, that just ain't even right. I ain't even trying to be a doctor, but can you at least have given me a James Earl Jones type voice or something? All I got is what I got. And I would just be so amazed, never knowing that there would be a day when I would stand here. Now, I am going to say this. It's going to be a shame, just going to be a shame, if the largest gift for your gift. He ain't my gift. He's my friend. He's your gift. It would just be a shame if the largest gift came from somebody who didn't belong to Apostolic. Now, I ain't trying to throw no shade. I'm just saying, if they get home, if they get home and they opening up their envelopes, as my grandmama would say, and the, and the best, best check that comes out of envelope is from me, huh? That's going to be problematic because he ain't my gift. He's my friend. So we're going to pray and then doorkeepers, y'all do what y'all do. And um, God, we thank you right now for the opportunity to walk through this gate today. We believe by faith that you've given us an opportunity to sow a seed into good ground. And we honor now this opportunity. Would you give us direction. Speak to us clearly, Lord, on that which you desire us to give. In Jesus' name, amen. Our doorkeepers, our ushers are going to give us direction, and we're going to follow them, coming with their baskets. I need you to be the giving police on your row. Just do the side eye to somebody that you don't see put something in the bucket. Don't say nothing to them. But, just, but, but do give him the side I like. And you, here's how you do it. And you always in his face, too. Just, just give him that kind of look like every time I turn around, you and First Lady Susan Faith, you ain't even give, put nothing in the bucket. Amen. All right, doorkeepers, we got to move because folk got that $10, $50 spirit on them right now. We don't want it to go to a George Washington spirit. Amen. All right. Uh, 
ushers, please pass the baskets. Thank you. Come on, give the man of God an appreciative praise as you give. Come on, praise the Lord. No, you heard a word from the Lord today. The, the stories are prophetic. You know, again, as, as I said earlier, my wife and I, we, we value friendships. We don't, uh, again, hobnob with everybody, but we watch people's character. You know that the source of our blessing is that we were trained by both Bishop Holly and Bishop Brazier how to walk before people in a godly way. So give the Lord praise one more time for Bishop Brown. No, give the Lord real praise even as you give. Pass those baskets. Don't. I, I wonder what the ushers, they, they, they're afraid to let the baskets go. You, you see, you have to give it to the people. Yeah, just, get, just turn them over to them. That's right. They know what to do. Don't stand. Yeah, just pass the basket. They'll give. They always do that. It takes us about two minutes to, to do an offering here. It doesn't take a long time. We appreciate what he has said. I will tell you, uh, again, uh, I have not tried to coach him nor direct him. As you all know, a few weeks ago, the Lord uh, pressed on my heart to preach from St. John 10. And I told you that as I do these series, I'm often not aware of, of, the, of the crux of what God is saying. And I've been telling you that if you tell me whichever voice you listen to, I can tell you your destiny. God uses people. Give the Lord praise. God uses people. That's, that's the Lord's order. He's going to use somebody to bless you so you will know it's not just you, it's that one God has given you. Today, you're in this audience of many of you, thousands right now by way of technology. You are watching these proceedings and the Lord has spoken to you from the voice of Bishop Brown and told you it's time for you to get right with God. If you're here today and you want to be saved, you want to be born again, I want you right now to stand at your feet Come down the aisle and say, I want God in my life. Give the Lord praise as they come. Come on, right now. Those baskets, it's easy to pass. Don't be distracted. Right now. Oh, come on, y'all. Give the Lord real praise as they come down the aisle. As they receive the voice, as they hear the message of God. Hands up, heart open. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You, come. Come now. Oh, cut your hands, saints, in the name of Jesus. Hands up. That's right. Come. Come. We lift you high, Lord. Lord, we lift you high. Hands up. That's right. Come. Come. Oh, clap your hands. Say, give the Lord praise for families coming now. Believe in God. Lord, we lift If you're on, again, that platform, that number on the screen, Answer the call. Oh, give God praise for young folk coming. Give the Lord praise. Let all the other names fade. Oh, Lord. Only you. Fade away. Jesus, take your That's why right. come, it's still time. Fade away. Take your place. Take your place. Hands up, heart. Why? Why? We lift you high. Lord, we lift you high. Hands up. Hearts open.
surrender your life to Christ when you know that there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved but at the name of Jesus every knee is going to bow every tongue is going to confess that he alone is Lord hallelujah we don't want to close without you your life to God is important and to us we care about what God is doing in your life these are difficult times but our God is able if you will trust in my faith you will never regret the day you came to Jesus you will not regret the day. Give the Lord praise for those that, that have come already, that are running down the aisle before it's too late. What an awesome message. Give the Lord praise even as they come. Look, give God praise. There's still time. Oh, no, we've got time. Souls are the reason that we are here. We're about to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. We're about to celebrate Holy Week. That's what it's all about. Give the Lord praise. Somebody else coming down the aisle. They want Christ in their life on this auspicious day that the Lord has sent us. We appreciate all that God has done and is doing. We appreciate all of you that have given and continue to give. Again, whether it's by cash app, whatever, we appreciate all of that. We take nothing for granted. We notate every gift that's been given to us every, every year because we understand it's the blessing of the Lord and we give God praise, glory, and honor for what he's doing. This week is so important that you don't want to miss on Wednesday night again. Uh, as you all know, we're walking with Jesus to the cross. We've got another week and a half, uh, and, and we start Holy Week uh, again with Palm Sunday. And you want to go to the website. You want to participate. Again, every year, we get tens of thousands of prayer requests during that week, and we nail each one to the cross. The cross will be prepared this coming week uh, as you come on Sunday. Uh, we'll be annotating all those, all those prayer requests that have come in by electronics. We will write them down and nail them to the cross. And we'll be preparing, again, prayer warriors every day. Go to the website. You can come down to the church Monday through Friday as we'll be praying and believing the Lord. Listen, on when, everybody say Wednesday night of Holy Week, we will not only teach about foot washing, we're going we're gonna to do a mass foot washing on Wednesday night. Give God praise. Come on. Yeah. So do what I've been doing. Get your, get your feet prepared. I won't go any further than that. My, my young daughter said, Dad, what's wrong with your feet? I said, be, leave me alone. I'm working on I got two weeks to work on my feet. And, <laughs> hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. But again, those are not only just ceremonial things. Those are principles that will teach us deep truths of Christ Jesus. 
And so again, prepare yourself in prayer. As you know, we, we've been fasting again this Lenten season. Those that have fasted with us, God bless you. Uh, in the name of the Lord, all these things are so important uh, as we walk with God together. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being kind to us. Amen. Give the Lord praise once again for the man of God. He's running after me. If I could sing, I'd be bad. Your goodness. Uh-huh. Everything. Oh, your goodness. He's running after me. Is that your testimony? Is that your testimony as well? Your goodness. Everyone stand that can with us. congregation at this time to allow our bishop and sister smith to exit so they can greet everybody and they have a little don um, gift for you which are little cupcakes amen amen so bishop and sister smith yes God, we thank you for such a wonderful day, Lord God. We thank you for giving us such wonderful leaders. We thank you for the people, Lord God. We thank you for being sheep. Mm, what a wonderful shepherd. We bless your name, Lord God. So on this day, let us shine your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. confession of faith and obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, the great head of the church, we now baptize you in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. 